Welcome to Peoples and Things, where we explore human life with technology. I'm Lee Vinsel. Years before Andy Russell and I wrote The Innovation Delusion, or even before we started The Maintainers, I was in graduate school, and one day I created a new folder on my computer entitled it The E and I Words. The E and I Words were entrepreneurship and innovation. And I was a graduate student at Carnegie Mellon University where these words were getting thrown around with great abandon, just as they were at nearly all other universities. I also belonged to professional societies where these words were getting used in ways that I found to be uncritical and simply going along with the ideological tide of our society. And I was bumping into these words all over in society, including in news coverage and popular culture. And these words, entrepreneurship and innovation, they were driving me insane. They were being used. So often, in so many ways, they had lost their meaning. So often, when you bumped into these words, you'd find that the sentences they were a part of were complete and utter bullshit. And when I say bullshit here, I mean philosopher Harry Frankfurt's definition of bullshit. They were sentences that were neither truths nor lies. They had no relationship to the truth whatsoever. They were meant to win people over and sell them something. And my thought with this project I called the E&I words was that what we needed were critical histories of these concepts to think about how they became so prominent in our culture and to explore what kinds of work people were using these concepts to do. And then, you know, life happens, things shift, we tumble through existence. And when Andy and I started working on the maintainers, we really focused on beating up on ideologies surrounding the term innovation. I mean, our book is called The Innovation Delusion, and entrepreneurship kind of fell by the wayside. The E and I words project remained incomplete. Well, thank God for friends. A couple years ago, my buddy Benjamin Waterhouse, a professor of history at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, started working on how self-employment became the ideal for so many Americans since the 1970s. And this year, his book, One Day I'll Work for Myself, The Dream and Delusion That Conquered America, came out. To be clear, Ben's book takes a wider angle than entrepreneurship to focus on ideals of self-employment of all kinds and why they have taken hold in this country. But it very much includes a critical history of the idea of entrepreneurship that I've always wanted to see. In the book and in our conversation, Ben covers everything from the history of the idea that, I quote, small businesses create most of the jobs in the economy, unquote. Nota bene, they also destroy the most jobs in our economy. To how we became obsessed with quickly growing startups as a way to deal with a stagnant economy. To the first work from home craze decades before COVID brought the idea once again to the fore. And all along the way, Ben shows how the ideal of self-employment has been used to reinforce the interests of the most powerful, as well as how poorly the idea has served the poor and struggling in our economy, who often feel forced into quote-unquote entrepreneurship, not because it's so attractive, but because they have no other choice. Ben and I also talk about a new project we're trying to get off the ground, another podcast that will be somewhat related to this one, simply called I Heart. 90s history. Gee, I wonder what that podcast could be about. This is one of those rare episodes where I have a complete and utter bud on. Because Ben lives so close to Virginia Tech, where I work and we make this podcast, he came on down to have an in-person chat. So this is one of those episodes where if you mosey on over to our YouTube channel, you can see us jawboning together. Ben and I became friends when we were still in grad school through the Business History Conference, a terrific gathering of folks that is still an intellectual home for the two of us. I have greatly enjoyed and have been very proud to watch Ben work on this and other projects over the years, and it was a real hoot 
to talk to him about one day I'll work for myself. You'll see. You'll see. And that's why you should, hey, get excited! Ben, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Lee, it is my pleasure. One day I'll work for myself as a neat book. If you were to explain it to a non-academic stranger, what would you say it's about and what were you trying to do with it? So my take on what this book is about is uh, that there's a dream, there's an ideal in American society, um, whether or not you follow through with it, that working for yourself is um, the best thing you can do. Mm -hmm. And the argument of the book is that although that idea goes way back in time, uh, it has taken on a particularly new meaning uh, in American life in the last 50 years. And so the, the way we think about work and about employment and about working for oneself in particular uh, is really grounded in the history of the 1980s, 90s, and 2000s, um, even if it kind of harkens back to, you know, age-old uh, ideas. Going on, I mean, like, when you say older traditions, you mean, like, going all the way back to, like, Jeffersonian and independence and stuff like that? I, look, yeah. there's, there's a sense in American society, American culture, that... Um, you know, when, when we talk about independence, uh, we mean a lot of things, right? I mean, right. Political independence, uh, rights and freedoms. Um, but in, in American history, there's this long-standing idea of like self-reliance as a principal goal and this sort of uh, independence. And yeah, Jefferson is sort of a, a hallmark of that yeah, um, right. way back in the 1780s. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, as, that's, that's, as, as I said, that's the, um, you know, the argument here is that there's a cultural ideal but it's refracted through lived political reality and economic reality uh, that's specific to the, to the recent generation. And so, you know, the way people talk about it today is really shaped by, and has shaped uh, the history of the last couple of decades. Mm -hmm. um, so I got a question for you. Why do you hate small business owners so much? So, I mean, I go out on a, I go out on a ledge uh, really in the beginning of the book um, to say some of my best friends are small business owners. <laughs> And, and I recognize that that's, you know, that's the cliche, right? That's the thing that you always say. I'm like, I can't be racist. Some of my best friends are, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I say it tongue in cheek. Um, at the same time, it's, it's true. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I talk and specifically, you know, I tell some stories in the book about my own family members, um, my father, my wife's parents. Um, and in fact, my wife uh, owns, a, owns a business of which I am a part owner, right? I'm, right. A, I'm a minority uh, owner in, in her uh, LLC. And so- So we should probably, I think Daniela wants us to, t so, so what is this company? Oh yeah, so, so my wife Daniela um, owns a company called Moon Angel Sweets, which produces uh, Brazilian style chocolate truffles uh, yeah. near our home in uh, Morrisville, North Carolina, and sells them online. Um, and uh, thank you to Virginia Tech for <laughs> providing me with this platform. Um, so yeah, so like, yeah, I, I don't hate small businesses and I don't hate business ownership and I have nothing against anyone who makes a personal decision uh, to go into business for themselves, um, to be an entrepreneur or to just be a freelancer or to be, you know, someone who just kind of gets out of the rat race. I think these are all uh, perfectly valid decisions and in fact, sometimes really rational uh, reactions to, yeah, yeah. to the market and to modern work. What I don't, uh, what I have a problem with is, is hype. Um, yeah. which I think is something that you and I get along with, get along on, you know, but, uh, and, and I don't like, you know, the kind of abuse of a concept, particularly by a political or economic class that tends to use it to, um, to exploit people and to, mm -hmm. you know, build up a dream in someone's mind, build up this idea that, you know, this is the way, the thing that you should do, um, and take advantage of it for someone else's gain. Yeah. So how did you get to this book? I mean, you, you, your first book, your district, you know, that came out of your dissertation is lobbying Americans about history of business lobbying and from the 70s onwards. And then you wrote a, you know, a, a, a survey history, business history of U.S. history. And so what led you to, like, how did you, you, how'd you get to this? Well, so, I mean, I can make a long story out of this. We can <laughs> tell me if, it, if it's too long. The, I came to business history 
from questions about politics. You know, when I went to grad school, I thought I would be trained as a political historian, and in many ways I was as a political historian, a social historian. Yeah. Um, but I got into the story of big business lobbying um, because I was really interested in what at the time, like in the early 2000s, was being kind of reframed as the the right turn in American politics, right? This sort of yeah. thing that happened in the 70s and 80s that, you know, where Reagan's election and Reaganomics and all that was really central to it. And the argument that I came to in my first book is that um, a very critical part of that political movement was the organization of, of business groups in particular, um, particularly the ones that mobilized large industrial corporations mm -hmm. in the 1970s. And that became Lobbying America. So I wrote about the US Chamber of Commerce and the Business Roundtable and, and groups like that. Um, by extension, I was writing about big business mm -hmm. and I was interested in you know, how they use their market power, obviously, in their kind of uh, political platform, but also how they shaped the way regular people in the political class and just voters and, and sort of members of the public in general thought about the issues that these organizations cared about. And that had to do with all of that right turn Reagan stuff, right? Yeah. Lower taxes, weaker regulations, weaker labor unions, uh, and so forth. And, and, I, and I kind of became a business historian uh, through that process. Right. And you know, there's, a, there's a cliche among um, the, the Business History Conference, which is our big, uh, our big organization, that you know, a lot of people kind of find themselves in those circles without ever thinking that they were business historians. Yeah. I got to it through technology, same thing, and, and politics too. But you know, we fell into it. You fall backwards into it a lot of times, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah. there's, as you know, almost every year we give out a, a book prize and like half the time the person says, well, I've never thought of myself as a business historian. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. it, it's become a cliche yeah, uh, yeah. among many of us, but, uh, you know, that, that's, that's how I see business history. I don't see it just narrowly construed as like the study of a particular firm or a particular industry, but really part of a, of a social, uh, social context. And, and that was the impetus behind the second book. So the Land of Enterprise uh, surveyed American business from more or less the beginning of the American political project that, you know, national origins through about the uh, financial crisis in 2008 to 2009. And, um, you know, the point of that book was to integrate the story of American business into the story of America more broadly. Right. Uh, so, it, you know, it was written... Uh, for classroom use, it was written for a general audience. It was written to kind of introduce people to the idea that, you know, business history shouldn't be seen, in my view, as this kind of boring, clunky state thing for people who, you know, just read The Economist and The Wall Street Journal or follow the stock market or whatever. But in fact, it's it's an integral part of of the way life works and it has throughout throughout our national history. Um, so given that background, I was really interested to continue this question of why do people think the things that they do about a range of issues related to, um, to business? And I started off thinking that this would be a kind of small business book, right? That, right? that if I wrote the big business book, now I'd write the small business book. And it turns out, you know, small business is a, a category that just, you can't, I, I couldn't anyway, make any sense of in an analytical way. You know, it's like, it, there's a definition of it. I tend to use the one that the Small Business Administration uses, which is fewer than 500 employees, which is like an enormous range of companies, right? right. All across different industries. Um, and there's, it's very hard to generalize about those kinds of, uh, those firms. And, you know, it has a place in our culture, right? It has a place in our mindset. Oh, I'm a small business owner. You know, this, this hurts or helps small business. That means something kind of on a visceral level, but analytically it's, all over the place. Um, and it was a lar largely for that reason that I kind of, as I was doing more research and, and thinking about this more, um, I gravitated toward a, an analysis, not of the business unit, whether it's small or big or whatever, but the idea of working for oneself, of yeah. owning it. And, um, and so I try to, in many ways, put the person at the center of the story. Uh, now, it's still vast and varied, and there's you know, as many as many reasons for going into business ownership as there are people who do it, right? right. And, and you can do it in a countless different ways. And there's millions and millions of people that this applies to. Uh, at the same time, I thought putting kind of the, the, the person and actually thinking of them as workers, right? So, so in a way, I, I think of this as, as a labor story, um, you know, was, was a way to kind of get at those issues. That's how I got there. Um, so... I don't know, maybe a year ago, I got asked to go on this podcast 
It's called like something like Million Dollar Books. You, I get invitations to go on podcasts to talk about the Innovation Delusion and stuff, and like because oh. the Innovation Delusion was a million dollar book. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly, exactly. The ironies. What I didn't realize though is that well, like the guy who runs his podcast, basically, it's kind of like one of these get rich quick schemes that you you kind of touch on in this yeah. book, and you might end up writing about in a future project. I know. But it, he has this whole thing about how you write ebooks, basically, and then you'll make a million dollars. So it's kind of like one of these things, right? He's got this whole shell around it. Is that post AI? Was that like he was real into AI? Yeah, because well, yeah, this yeah. is something, I and mean, people do it, right? Or try. Yeah, he well, he was very high on how he was going to use AI for all kinds of things on his website and stuff. And I had to inform him that they just lie to people, you know, fairly frequently. He didn't know this, and it was like he was shocked. But um, but anyway, I, you know, he at the end of it, I uh. Uh, I, he said, like, what, what, what are other books I should have on here, right? I guess it's like a standard question he asks people on this podcast. And I told him, well, you should have my buddy Ben on to talk about his book, One Day I'll Work for Myself. And then I, had, I like, went to the website and like, had the to- full title. And he just like, he just like his jaw dropped. Uh, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was my ticket to a million dollar book, Lee. You're killing me. No, he got really worked up about it, right? Like, because he could just tell the thesis from the the title. That guy, right? (laughs) (laughs) But like, so I want to talk about the delusion part of it, because I I actually think that guy was pretty caught up. So use this word delusion in your subtitle. So what what for you? I mean, I use it in mind in in the innovation delusion. Yeah, so I I ripped you off. I mean, uh, that part is clear. Um, So I was, I remember really clearly struggling with the subtitle. And I was like, and I knew most of it and I had it all kind of coming together and, and I was like, all right, dream, yeah, but if I just call it the dream, you know, even if I say it conquered, like that's a good thing. That's going to sound unambiguously positive. And I know that already the book is going to kind of look like the books that it sits next to on the bookshelf, uh, yeah. which all kind of make the opposite point. Um, and so I was like, all right, well, delusion, that's, that's, on, that's an alliteration, right? I got dream and delusion, but it, man, it's harsh. And, and I couldn't, and for a while I was like, yeah, should I back off? And I was like, Eventually, I just said, no, it's, yeah. it's not a delusion for everyone. Um, it's, not, you know, it's not that to be a business owner, to work for yourself is to be deluded, but it can be. And I think it's important to recognize the limitations of this, um, particularly when, it's, when business ownership and self-employment are offered as solutions to problems, yeah. um, particularly by politicians, by major corporations, um, by the economic elites who say, you know, Whatever the problem is, work for yourself. I mean, I use like, there's a couple of examples I have in the book. They're all over the place, but you know, one that comes to mind immediately was um, the kind of movement to encourage women in the 1980s uh, to work from home and, and start home-based businesses as a solution to childcare problems, yeah. right? Um, and th- this still exists right, very much, and it, it came oh, out yeah. to the way out in, in the uh, wake of COVID. But it, you know, so. I trace it back to this moment in the 1980s when telecommuting was like starting to be a big thing. And you see all these people saying, you know, look, I'm living the dream. I'm having, you know, I'm having it all, which is the, the sort of slogan um, about, you know, women working. And uh, th- what they're really saying is we have a problem of, you know, childcare provision, but rather than solve that problem right. through some sort of social or political means, uh-huh. we're going to do an end run around it and you can, you know, Work, work from home while your baby's napping or while your right, kid's right. at preschool, which is bonkers. It's, bonkers. it's just insane. And, and, you know, so it just doubles down on the problem without... Um, and racial poverty and stuff too, right? I mean, yeah. Right. So like, there's, I have another chapter about, you know, um, or at least a section of it about uh, immigrant entrepreneurship, which is a very important phenomenon. A lot of studies of it recently, going back in time historically. Um, and there's a lot of positive messages that, that can be uh, understood from this history, but there's also an underlying current of necessity. Um, there's a, a very common trope, again, today and in the past, yeah. uh, going you know, back decades, hundreds of years, that new immigrants to the United States frequently find themselves in uh, entrepreneurial positions or starting new companies because they're excluded from the mainstream work market. Yeah. Right, because they have a language barrier, cultural barrier, outright racism and xenophobia. Um, and as a result, they you know, find their, their networks, they find their, their, their social uh, commonalities and, and, and cultural groups and gravitate towards certain things where they can actually succeed. Yeah. And from an individual story, that's a story of triumph, right? Overcoming obstacles. From a collective societal story, 
that's you know making the making making the best out of a terrible situation and and avoiding the underlying problems the xenophobia and so forth totally and there's a couple other delusions that you draw out too that i wanted to kind of highlight before we kind of hop into the historical narrative which is one of them is like you and i have talked about at great length is kind of entrepreneurship and like startup rates so like there's we've been pushing entrepreneurship for you know as long as you know you talk about this push but yet we don't really see it in like how many businesses are being created for instance do we no that's right i mean and i'm far from the first person to point this out yeah. this is fairly standard uh that the the churn of of business formation in the united states has been declining since the measurements have been even reasonably accurate from the late 1970s so effectively our entire lifetimes right yeah. The so business dynamism is the term right. that, that is used, and it it has been declining. There's little peaks and ups and downs, yeah. um, but it is not the case that this is a like robust, you know, innovative, fast growth, topsy turvy environment. Some there are certain sectors where for certain periods of time that sure. appears to be the case, um, but it's simply not the case that you know this is a, a really robust entrepreneurial society where you know everybody with grit and a good idea can you know suddenly <laughs> yeah. make it to the top. Yeah. Um, you know, you can't just kind of grind it out till you make it. I mean, and I shouldn't say you can't, right? Some people do, right? And this is, again, a big problem with the way we talk about these dreams and talk about uh, the policies that, that we want to make. Because if we, if we get kind of hung up on the idea that um, anybody can make it, it's real easy to triple, trickle over into everybody can make it. And so the you know, example I've used in other interviews and stuff is like, look, someone's going to play first base for the Yankees. It's just not going to be you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the other one, you know, another kind of classic one is like this idea uh, that small businesses create more jobs than any other form of company, right? Or large corporation. Right. And again, this gets to what I was saying at the beginning about small business being a really difficult, if not completely useless concept. Um, yeah. Because it means lots of different things, and and it includes even by the SBA's definition, basically ninety nine point nine percent of all businesses, right? And so, you know, ninety nine point nine percent of all businesses create more than half the jobs, slightly more. Well, I should freaking hope so. <laughs> you know, it's like all of the businesses. Um, they also destroy as many, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it comes out in the wash, and and the the research is. Uh, is inconclusive. Um, there's a lot of, you know, a uh, little, especially historically, once you get back uh, into the past, it's a lot harder to get decent data on, on this sort of stuff. What I've been persuaded by is that the kind of best estimate we have is that size has basically no predictive value. Um, newer companies tend to create jobs, even when you account for, for deaths, but accounting for, for job deaths is a big deal, right? Because companies fail. Um, yeah. But there's n it's nowhere near the the role that it has come to play in the imagination, right? And this goes back, you know, I tell the story in an early chapter about um, one person who was maybe more responsible than anybody else. He was an, uh, a researcher named David Birch in the 1970s who started publishing uh, reports that he later kind of backtracked on, right? Saying that, well, from this period to this period, um, you know, small businesses or businesses of a certain size, you know, accounted for eight out of ten jobs. And as he pointed out, it kind of depended on where you cherry pick the numbers from yeah. um he himself said like you know that that's that's overstating it quite a lot but that didn't stop everybody from running with it yeah, every yeah, politician yeah. every you know big business person Portions don't work though i mean that's the problem right it's just like <laughs> that's a beautiful meme to kind of like it's very handy to lots of people it fulfills certain fantasies that our culture has and 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 it's not there's it's you know if, if your goal as a policymaker is to increase employment um, you know, I, I, that's too simple a way to do it. I mean, yeah. the, the, you and I have talked about this as well. Like the unemployment number, which is, you know, has its problems and oh. its measurement, but, you know, it goes up and down. You know, we don't have more people looking for jobs now, but the jobs themselves could be shittier, right? So the relevant metric is not how many jobs there are, but how good the jobs are. Uh, and that, that's something that also gets lost um, Look, there are great small business employers, yeah. but there are small business employers that, you know, maybe people want to work for them because it's more, you know, of a better community or like that, but yeah. they, maybe they don't, can't pay as well, right? Yeah. Or maybe they can't pay very much at all, um, particularly to their founders, 
There's a whole lot of people who run small businesses who themselves work super hard and don't make a lot of money. So uh, the employment stuff is, is really easy to misuse. Um, so your first chapter is called The Way We Worked. And do, do you get it? Do you, do you get the joke? The way we worked? It's like the way we were. Oh. You have to have my accent, I think. <laughs> it's a pun, Lee. I didn't get it. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> It's all over this thing. Yeah, yeah, that is for sure. And, um, yeah, music lyrics? There's some music lyrics. Yeah. And network. You start with network. I start with the movie Network. Yeah. It's, uh, you, there's a lot of wordplay in the book. I didn't catch this one. Um, so tell us, it's kind of a background chapter, but there's also, you also have an argument here that you want to kind of set up. So why don't you... I mean, for people who don't know a lot about business history and the history of employment, why don't you go ahead and kind of paint the picture you want people to have in their heads, but also kind of tell them, you know, set up, do the goal thing too, you know, tell them, put the argument forward. All right. So chapter one of the book opens in the 1970s mm -hmm. and then quickly backtracks to the post-World War II period. And, and I'm painting deliberately with a very broad brush. Uh, and I make a point that, as, as you point out, is, is you know, Pretty common among people who think about 20th century businesses, but not necessarily part of the general conversation, which is in the post-war period, the 1950s and 60s, uh, the, the large corporation was a relatively new phenomenon, and it yeah. just like bestrode the economy. Um, it, it shaped the way people theorized about economic growth, about efficiency, yeah. uh, and so forth. And you know, for, and my point in, the, in that chapter is kind of for better and for worse, um, there was a lot of misgivings about it. There were certainly people who were like, oh my God, this thing is, you know, this large corporation is impersonal. It is bureaucratic. It's anti-democratic because it holds all this power, economic power, political power, um, and so forth. And there were others who were like, it's the most efficient way of organizing work and production and economic growth that we've ever seen. <laughs> and not for nothing, this is a period of time of spectacular economic growth. and relatively, relative to other points in history, relatively evenly shared growth. Right. It's not to say that everybody was great and no. that there weren't horrible social problems and exclusions. However, this is, this is the, the kind of big story of the post-war period. Um, the rising tide was, was, was lifting. Yeah. Boats, yeah. most boats, maybe not all boats, but most boats. And you know, the, the gap between the richest and the poorest Americans was shrinking over this period of time. And middle-class standards of living were rising. Now, some people looked at that and were like, oh my God, it's all ticky tacky suburban. Yeah, the anti materialists and consumers. So the consumer culture, yeah, the, yeah. the counterculture gets in on this, and yeah. like everybody's like, oh, you know, man in the gray flannel suit, and it's yeah. all kind of boring and, <laughs> um, and conformity. Yeah, right. So, like, and even conservative people like had that. Like, so, William White is the journalist who wrote um, Organization Man in yeah. the 1950s, and the critique there was like, this is sucking the, the soul out of, um, out of, middle managers and making yeah. them all these drones. Anyway, that's the, the mid 20th century picture. The point I try to make in this first chapter is that it existed in tension. Like it created a tension between people who are like, this has lots of positive benefits and this is stultifying and, and conformist and, uh -huh. and so forth. And you know, not for nothing, but like the social groups that were mobilizing in exactly this moment of economic prosperity and rising yeah. expectations wanted nothing more than to be a part of that corporate culture. Right, so I mentioned things like the civil rights movement, the march on Washington for jobs and freedom, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Oh, Which is the types of jobs that, for example, African Americans were being excluded from were precisely the gray flannel suit jobs. Right, that would have right. been and that feminism, too, feminism as well, yeah, right? So yeah. as women are entering the workforce in larger numbers and clamoring uh, and, and organizing, you know, through second wave feminism to break down uh, gender barriers to certain types of employment, um, the the opportunities that are offered by corporate work. Yeah. as humdrum, boring, and whatever as it seems to be, was the thing that they were fighting for because yeah. that was the way to succeed. Um, now, of course, there were people who loved small businesses and main street shops and you know the sort of entrepreneurial spirit, but there were also plenty of economic thinkers and politicians who kind of gave it all a, a little bit of a backseat. Um, I mean, I, there's a quote that I love that I stumbled across in, in another published book about small business where um, you know somebody went to the... Uh, the Chamber of Commerce uh, had a magazine, the Chamber of Commerce is a national uh, lobbying association, and they have a, uh, an in-house magazine, um, and their salespeople were kind of at a meeting where they were going to be uh, 
I don't know, just kind of sent out to to sell the magazine, and and somebody, one of the regional sales reps, says to the the editor, uh, you know, there's we got a lot of small business people who um, read our magazine, but the magazine is always about General Electric and about Boeing and yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, could we do a feature from time to time on like the small businessman? And the editor looks at me, and goes, "Over my dead body." And this is like 1950 something. Um, so that just you know, it's one anecdote, but it gives right. you a sense for the way in which. Um, the whole culture was really geared toward the, the large corporation yeah. as something that, you know, maybe it had problems, maybe it could be tamed, maybe it could be regulated, yeah. um, but it, it wasn't to be, uh, you know, gotten rid of. Yeah, uh, yeah, and yeah. that's what starts to change in the 70s, where mm -hmm. you, get, you get a resurgence of the nostalgia and a, and a continuation of the kind of uh, critique of conformity and, and, and bureaucratic, yeah. you know, sluggishness and, and then you combine that with failure, right? Mm -hmm. You combine that with, with economic uh, crisis, with um, the, you know, ma major bankruptcies, um, with the, the kind of collapse of um, employment opportunities, especially at industrial companies, and the kind of public image starts to shift. Um, and, you know, corporations still persist. They're st and big business still is important. But the idea of where the kind of ideal work lies this is the argument of the rest of the book, starts to change. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what's one of the reasons that by the time the 21st century rolls around, you know, young people are not aspiring to go be middle managers at Verizon. Yeah, yeah. Right? right. Many of them do. And those people yeah, can do, yeah. you can do really well for yourself. Oh, totally. But especially if you go to like, you know, elite universities and stuff, the kids are like, nah, man, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, startup I'm going to do a startup, startup or, um, or maybe I'll go be a consultant um, and, you know, work for something small, but make a ton of money telling some big, stupid company how to run its, <laughs> run its businesses. Um, but, you know, the, that whole notion of a career track where you go to a large national firm and work your way up, yeah. um, it's not part of the way people think anymore. Um, you know, what, when you were telling that story, it reminded me of a piece I think you wrote after you were done, mostly done with this book, which is that Big Brother in the Holding Company essay, which I think is full of song puns. Oh, okay. Well, but I think like, in that essay, if I remember correctly, I mean, part of what you're saying is that what we call neoliberalism and, you know, think of it as like this conservative thing also has roots in this like 60s counterculture um, thing. So I, I like, that seems very related to this, what the argument you're playing out here, right? Yeah. I mean, on a cultural level, I think that's right. You know, the, yeah. the point I make, and, and again, I'm not reinventing the wheel here, but the, the fundamental critique of the counterculture as it understood itself in the late 1960s was against technocracy. Yes. Right. Right. That ends up in STS, by the way. They, like the critique of technocracy is all over the seventies and the nineties, and it's all boomer, uh, new left kids. Basically, it's like people of that generation. Right. It's saying that this is conformist. This is stultifying. Yeah. This is, um, you know, restricting my my individual freedom as a as a you know child of Gaia or whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that's, yeah. There's, there's, a, there's a connection um, and it's, it's related, I mean, on a cultural level, and this is way more in your wheelhouse than mine, but it's, it's related to the, the mentality of the early internet um, yeah. and, and the growth of Silicon Valley and the tech industry, what would become, you yeah. know, what's now just a series of very large corporations being, yeah. doing large corporation stuff in the seventies um, seemed like they were different, you know, yeah, they were, yeah, the, yeah. the, 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 the Wozniaks of the world were going to like really stick it to the establishment. Um, so yeah, I do think that there's a, there's a connection and that not, I mean, that that's part of the, the reason that um, this notion of, you know, starting your own company, being your own boss gets this sort of social yeah, yeah. and cultural grip on people because then they see, well, Steve Jobs, you know, does this in his garage and suddenly he's, you know, super rich and, and whatever. Um, then Bill Gates and all the kind of heroic um, stories of the people starting from allegedly nothing, although as, yeah. we, as we know, they weren't usually starting from nothing. Yeah. The, um, well, you already kind of touched on this and maybe there's not much more you want to say about it, but one of the parts you put it, so in, in the chapter after, after that is that, you know, big, big, small business is kind of discovered, right? Yeah, I read it. Yeah. So like, what, what do you think is 
going on in that moment? You already kind of talked about this guy. Was it, is it Birch who's- Yeah, so so Birch, I mean, I think he's, he's feeding a machine that's in already the in the 70s. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, the argument that I make is that the, you know, the, the, the long simmering critique of corporate culture um, gets jacked up in the 70s, it really gets amplified by, um, by economic hard times, right? And by what Jimmy Carter is, you know, yeah, he doesn't yeah, call yeah. it malaise, but, you know, we, we, we say the malaise yeah. speech, uh, even though he doesn't say that. Um, the, the, you know, this notion that there's something wrong with America. There's energy yeah. crises. There's cars lined up for gas. There's foreign countries yeah. that are eating our lunch. There's imported cars from Japan and Germany. Um, there's an environmental crisis and limited resources and all of this sort of like things that seem so optimistic and energetic and, and, and endless as recently as the early 60s suddenly seem limited. And um, I think, you know, the argument I make is that that's related to this rediscovery of the virtue of the small. Yep. And again, this is a really kind of top, you know, stratospheric connection uh, that, I'm, yeah. that I'm sort of implying. Um, but, you know, the environmental movement, for example, um, is rooted in the notion of, of, of small smallness. Is small is beautiful. And big is polluting and big is, is, un, yeah. is unjust and, and so forth. And so, you know, that gets picked up and I think amplified by the idea that maybe in, in the realm of business, small is also um, better. What's, you know, and that's, I think there's, there's a lot of that. What I think is, is most significant, this is the argument I make in that chapter of the book, is that people like Birch and, and others start to say, it's not only that small is beautiful and like kind of good for your soul, but that's, it's going to solve your economic problems. Mm -hmm. That it's in fact being smaller, uh, sleeker, yeah. leaner and meaner, entrepreneurial, innovative, all of these things that, you know, your big ITT type, you know, corporations are not, that's the thing that's going to get us out of this. Um, and that becomes the mantra of the eighties, yeah. right? That becomes the go-go, like, you know, for all of the, you know, the fact that the eighties is, is, you know, big finance and big mergers and acquisitions and stuff. There's also a kind of slimming down, yeah. um, so uh, Jerry Davis, business professor in Michigan, um, makes a, a you know an argument about the kind of what he calls the vanishing corporation yeah. as um, even even though there's all these mergers, the kind of average size and scope of the corporation is is sort of diminishing. There's it's a turn toward uh, toward core competency, toward you know kind of deconglomeratization, and that in my view is all kind of part and parcel to this notion of. Um, of small is better, but also small is more efficient. Small is uh, more energetic, and and it's gonna, the thing that's going to fix low growth, uh, yeah. slack, you know, profits. Um. Well, and you've said you kind of said this in it briefly earlier, but it also this chapter in that way also kind of sets up an argument that runs throughout the book that a lot of this kind of like turn to small business is driven by lack, want. Hard times, yeah, all of these kinds of on things. an individual level as well as a sort of societal economic level. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you do kind of like in this chapter, um, kind of flash back to earlier times to like yeah. you go back to Wright Patman, which um, I just you have this weird um obs hatred of Wright Patman or something like that. Man, he's got a lot to hate, dude. <laughs> I mean, racist Southern Democrat from Texas who. <laughs> Wants to stick it to everybody, yeah. But he's also kind of idealized some by some people, right? I think like yeah, is Matt yeah. Stoller, uh, the, the kind of anti-monopoly people, uh, right. you know, like look back at him and as a kind of hero. Sure. Um, so I mean, right. The 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 short story is that the, you know Patman is a uh, sort of a, a, a prairie populist in the spirit of William Jennings Bryan, who comes to Congress, I believe it's in 1928. Um, from Texas, from rural, uh, I think it's West Texas. He's a Democrat. Um, and like many Southern Democrats, he's, his, you know, he's all over the place, right? Yeah. He, he's, he's in favor of the New Deal, broadly speaking, uh, and is in favor of the little guy against the big guy. Right. Um, and I think there's a lot that's appealing in that. He's also perfectly willing to uh, support and abide by Jim Crow racism and white supremacy. Um, and you know, one view on that is the same that people apply to Franklin Roosevelt. That's it's it's excusable because it was necessary to kind of make the progressive gains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think there's a very 
compelling counter argument that yeah, is that it was not excusable and that that was, uh, you know, yeah. racism in, in favor of, you know, labor unions is still racism. Yes. Um, and so anyway, so, yeah, he's he's central in the 1930s in particular to um, an effort to to, you know, really support small businesses um, in the face of competition from monopolistic large chain stores. Yeah. Right. So this is a story that I as you say, I kind of flash back to, it's yeah, very yeah. well told, um, by Susan Spellman, yeah, uh, yeah, our yeah. friend who writes about corner grocery stores and, uh, and by Mark Levinson in his book on the, on the A and P. Um, so there's, there's a lot of good stuff that explains Patman in his time. Yeah. Um, especially, you know, at the time of sort of his most, uh, his, his greatest moment of effectiveness. Um, you know, I think there's also a lot of good evidence that that moment passed. And by the 40s even, and certainly by the 50s and 60s, you know, the United States did not become an, a, a nation of small shopkeepers. It became an era, a nation of, of large uh, national chains and corporations. Um, not to say that everyone loved it. There's plenty of antitrust, you know, activity by the government, um, but, but it's in response to the fact that there's plenty of things to be, you know, going after with, yeah. with antitrust law. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what, you know, the, I wanted to set that up. I, I do that sort of backtrack. Um, in the chapter, um, in spite of you, um, I believe you were the one who told me to cut that out, that all out. So, <laughs> so if, if, right. if your, if your listeners agree that that's like a, a, a stupid part of the chapter, then, then you were right. And, uh, um, I actually thought it was good in, in when I read it again, because I think it, I think, you know, I think with history books, it's important to kind of go back and say there's, there's traditions that run deeper than the story you're going to focus on. The, the, the next chapter I feel like is kind of a hark back to your first book and that you're talking about business associations kind of, right? So you have the National Federation of Independent Business and the National Association of Women Business Owners. And it seems to me part of your story here is how, again, business is organizing. And it's and in some ways, it's like, even though it can be cast as like small versus big, and frequently it is, it also is, is can it kind of just be like business against minimum wage hikes or whatever, right? And so it turns into a kind of conservative business conglomerate in a, in a way. So when I said that Wright Patman lost his, his influence, um, I, years ago, I wrote a really early chapter of this um, related to this stuff. And, and the, the title of the, of the chapter or the title of the uh, article was uh, Wright Patman is Dead. Uh -huh. and, and it sort of picks up the story from when Wright Patman literally died uh -huh. in, in the mid-1970s. And the, the, the argument that I make is that like, the vision of small business politics that he had was one of you know, small businesses coming together to fight the predations of big business. Yeah. And that you know, largely fizzled. Yeah. And even in the 70s, when, when you know, sort of this, this moment of the rediscovery of small business was happening, the politics of it was largely dovetailing with the interests and the politics of the big businesses, right. which you're absolutely right. right. This, is, this is the crossover, like this is the Venn diagram of, these, of the first book and the third book yeah, here, right? Yeah, this yeah. is where, um, and it might just be like, you know, sometimes in, this, in a book like this, you got to like exercise the demons from the, yeah. <laughs> from the first project, <laughs> like fight fights I didn't figure out 15 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly right. The, the National Federation of Independent Business was created way before my period. It was created in the 1940s. Um, it's pretty sleepy for about a quarter century, but it really gets you know, much more active, mobilized, and, and, and larger in the late 1960s into the 1970s. But it dovetails with the Chamber of Commerce, with the Business Roundtable, all doing the exact same thing. Right. Anti-regulation, anti-wage hikes. Um, you know, minimum wage is a huge thing for, um, you know, opposing the minimum wage is a huge thing for the, for the NFIB. Um, and so, you know, they're, in a lot of ways, their politics pretty much dovetail with the yeah. politics of big business. And it allows everyone from the Chamber of Commerce on down to say in terms of politics that there's such a thing as the business point of view. Like, and when you get into the details, there's always, there's always differences, right? Yeah, yeah, Allocations yeah, yeah. and whatnot. But like, when it, when, by the time you get to sort of, Reagan era politics. There's like what's good for business, and then like all these terrible things that these lefty progressive union types are going to do. That's going to make things even worse. Yeah, yeah. And so this this notion of like a business view of politics is, I think, a really important part of this period. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, comes out of that. 
And, you know, I make the same case about the National Association of Women Business Owners, which comes out of a very different moment and it comes out of second wave feminism and it comes out of empowerment and it be, and it becomes, it's feminist, it's corporate uh, feminist, but it's, it's, you know, about empowering women and about, um, creating networks between women owned businesses. Uh, and when it gets more politically active, although it is opposed to sexism and it's in favor of, you know, equal protection laws and, and, and wage equality and, yeah. and these types of things, it also largely backs the, you know, business agenda, um, by the eighties. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to. I was looking over here because um, uh, my buddy Sam Hasselby tipped me off to a guy who's another Barber Field student, and I, I'm gonna mess up his last name, but it's like Keith Origel or something like that. Um, and he has a book coming out next year on like rural voters, and I think part of his picture is kind of like rural elites versus rural workers, and how like this kind of plays out. And I really kind of I want I'm really looking forward to reading th that book that a part of his argument in light of this chapter and other arguments you've made. Cause it seems like, you know, you can imagine those rural elites like fitting into this sm small business owner. And we know those kind of the places like those kinds of folks playing Trumpism and the Tea party movement and all that. It's the American stuff. gentry. Yeah. This yeah. is, this, this, that's just <laughs> that kind of argument. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, so the other part of this, which I don't think we've touched on yet, you and I have spent countless hours talking about this, is that all right, kind of we touched on it when we were doing the delusion thing. Small businesses are like 99% of enterprises, if you're just counting right. Most of them, not only is there's all this churn, like, yeah, they start up a lot of, they create a lot of jobs. They also destroy a lot of jobs as restaurants and all these kinds of things go under. Um... But also, most of them don't grow, right? And, and yet, like, or they grow. They grow for a very brief amount of time, and then they reach their stat, their size. Yeah, exactly. They plateau very quickly, right? Um, and yet, you discover this moment in the in the eighties, I think, right, where growth, like the fact that these things, it's kind of like it's like early startup stuff before, and that wasn't how they were talking about it. But it was this vision of. Like these things are going to be growth machines, not for the economy, but also like a real privilege of, I don't know, what do these people call them? Like gazelles or something, right? Like these firms that are just going to grow like crazy and create all kinds of value. Right. Yeah. And th there's definitely a moment around this and there's, and it's a, it creates a conflict between yeah. um, the vast majority of um, independently owned companies. And that might be right. a better way to say it than small Plumbers business. and restaurants and yeah, whatever. Or, or tax preparers yeah, or, yeah. you know, retail establishments yeah. or even ball bearing, you know, producers that have 25 employees. I mean, there's yeah, a, yeah. as I said, it's a category that is so capacious right. as to be kind of useless. But there's, there's, a, there's a moment and it has a, you know, a real political energy to it that, that starts to say, um, no, it's, it's, it's all about growth. It's all, and, you know, you start to hear the word entrepreneurship a yeah. lot more in this period, yeah. meaning business schools are getting involved in it. Right. And, and what they mean is it's not just the owning of the company by yourself, but the undertaking, the starting of the new. And because that's where growth comes, right? You, you have to, you know, if you start from whatever, you know, no one has ever in the history of the world, cr like launched a big business. <laughs> right. You can, you can, you can absorb, yeah. you can buy and merge and all that sort of stuff. We got to be careful and think about Soviet Union, maybe. I mean, there might be cases of planned economies where it's like, we're just going to set up a huge factory and it's going to be. Big. All right, fine. I'll, I'll concede <laughs> that. But like, you see my, my general I point though. I mean, point. even yeah, the biggest, general. you know, once upon a time, Andrew Carnegie was just like, all right, here we go. Here we go. Yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so growth becomes the kind of mantra. Um, yeah. and I, I tell the story of a yet another, um, Business Association. I think my editor was a little sick of me talking about, you know, <laughs> business interest groups. And it's like when Richard John talks about the post office again, everyone's like, knock it off, bro. <laughs> Look, you know, you know what you know, man. I mean, yeah, we got to. Our hobby horses. To totally. Back to. Um, I think I finally like, I, I think I finally purged the business interest. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, you know, who knows? Um, but anyway, I was talking, I, I, I told the story of, of a um, kind of early Reagan era business association that was put together by a couple of Democrats uh -huh. um, who, you know, one of whom uh, came out of the, his name's Arthur Levitt uh, Jr. He comes out of, he's an investor. 
He's a, he's a CEO of a, of a stock exchange. His father had been the comptroller of New York uh, decades earlier. And he becomes, he, he had been involved with the Carter administration and kind of boosting small business, but he comes, he becomes increasingly convinced that you need to put the voice of fast growth uh -huh. companies. Uh -huh. um, and, and the challenge here is that, you know, fast growth companies um, are really what's going to knock off these big, what they call like sclerotic corporate yeah. bureaucracies right. that are stultifying. And this, as I said, you know, it, it's a political mobilization. The policy positions, as I said, they're all kind of the same. The policy positions are not particularly revolutionary, but it's like putting this notion on the map that it's, it's, you got to grow fast. You got to- It becomes disruption by the nineties. It's like Clayton Christensen and all that stuff, right? Right. It becomes, it becomes disruption. It becomes move fast and break things. Yeah. It becomes, um, you can't possibly regulate me because if you regulate me, you're putting me in chains and yeah, I can't- Innovation or whatever. Yeah. But it's also this huge attack on the mid-century corporation. Uh -huh, and the idea right. that management is um, like the key thing that you should focus on. Yeah. So it's exactly the same period of time where the business schools, you know, which are created as masters of business administration, like right. the yeah. MBA yeah. is to create, is to yeah. teach people to manage. Right. And then now it really becomes, you know, people want to take classes in how to attract venture capital or how to write a business yeah. plan. Right. Uh, and it, so it, it really changes the kind of intellectual uh, approach to, yeah. to business ownership. Um, there's an example that I use when I teach this uh, to my students as well, which is the um, the, the famous speech in, in um, Wall Street from 1987. You know, uh, Gordon Gecko gives the speech and greed is good is the punchline. But if you listen to the part of that scene before he says greed is good, which is kind of disconnected and it's a quote, he's quoting Ivan Bosky and, and whatever. But um, what he's really talking about is the difference between a growth oriented, move fast, break things, you know, buy and sell, wheel and deal m mentality and a stultified, boring, uh, you know, stuck in the mud, right. bureaucratic culture. Because yeah. he's going on and on about, you know, oh, these vice presidents and they're hunting trips and, you know, they're, yeah. they're all making big salaries, but they don't have own any stock. Management has no interest in the company. And so this, this is a major change in the way we think about what businesses are. And as yeah. I, you know, again, it, it's part of a large cultural process, but I do think that this is, part and parcel to the way people think about, um, you know, businesses in general and, and what role they as owners could possibly play. Yeah. And you, you get into the history of ideas a bit too. I mean, I, there's a kind of a rediscovery of Joseph Schumpeter in this moment. I've done en engrams and I think the term neo Schumpeterian like is basically created in like 87, 88, you see it come out of nowhere. And I, you know, I, I don't, I haven't seen like, you know, you do a very nice, uh, history of, like how he's kind of rediscovered. I have yet to see like a really deep academic like rediscovery treatment. Cause I think there was, my argument would be, I would probably go so far and then I'm happy to be proved wrong. Is that the fact that we talk about Schumpeter these days and like his picture of creative destruction is really a product of the post 1980 period when he gets rediscovered. I think like no one's talking about him in that way in the seventies or very few people. I think if we look back at, at academic articles. So what I was most uh, interested to learn when I was looking into this um, is the, the difference between Schumpeter as a historian looking backwards yeah. from, from the 1930s and 40s, right? When, he, yeah, when he's yeah, writing yeah, the, yeah. the book to Schumpeterianism as a forward looking thing, yeah. right? Because the actual Schumpeter was describing the rise of industrial capitalism in the late 19th century. Yeah. why it happened and why it was so unusual in the history of the world, right? This is yeah. the sort of Robert Gordon sense of like, <laughs> most important thing ever happened happened in 1870, right? It's yeah. like, boom, um, this <laughs> yeah. stuff, this stuff happens. And how do you explain that? Yeah. And so that's what he was, that's what he thought entrepreneurship, you know, played a, a, an important role and why these gales yeah. of creative construction. I thought it was over. Right, but it was over because yeah. this was the age of the big corporation, yeah. right? This was the age of, of what the Berlian means kind of, um, you know, big corporate entity, which was, you know, for better or for worse, going to take us into, into the future. Socialism, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's in the title. Yeah. You know, it's Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy is right. the book that Schumpeter wrote. When he's rediscovered, he's repurposed as um, this is the cure to our problems that's really today. Nice. Yeah, that's good. Um, right. 
And like, so Peter Drucker is um, also an, an another Austrian economist who is, is a critical part of the story, who also makes this shift from entrepreneurship as a historical phenomenon uh -huh. to entrepreneurship that is available to everybody, yeah. right? Anyone can, and, and it's a skill. And because it's yeah, a skill, yeah, yeah. it can be taught. And yeah. so you can teach people to be innovative disruptors. Right. Right? And, yeah. and therefore, here, go learn, and now go forth and do likewise. Um, and there you are. Yeah. Um, my buddy, Maul Sauter, they haven't finished this project, but um, in, in grad school, they were working on a... Um, I, uh, you remember I, that? No, but I met them last weekend. Okay. Well, they were at the, the thing sure, in Copenhagen. Yeah. Um, so. Well, they've been at BHC a lot recently, but um, uh, they were working on basically like the spread of disruption from like Harvard Business School via like Christensen into Silicon Valley culture where it's everything, you know, like. So that would they, be the diffusion of disruption? The dif you got it. Yeah, yeah, like, you got it. The diffusion of disruption and how like it became like a thing where like you think it can guide choices and stuff. Like you can see, you think you can see the disruptive firm and like bet on it as a VC as an example, right? Um, but I think you do a really nice history kind of like laying out the early roots of that kind of stuff. I believe this is the chapter you started with. It's also probably my favorite chapter still is the work from home stuff. Yeah, another pun in that chapter, in that title. I don't know if you got that one. Which, what, what was, what's that? Home. I'm sorry, buddy. Man. I fail you. I fail you left and right. Slogan in the in during the Vietnam War was "Bring the war home." Oh, I so see. this is bring the work. Man, if I have to explain the jokes, Lee, I have failed utterly. Gee. I'm probably no. I'm just really bad with wordplay. And I history. know you like hate trivia games and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You... Well, I will. I will make sure that Ben Gross, my friend, historian of technology and business, Ben Gross, listens to this. He'll he'll get it all. Please, I, I just I need <laughs> the validation of people. Yeah. Enjoying my wordplay, God. Yeah. <laughs> Give me that at least. <laughs> but um, no, so, I mean, this chapter is fascinating for all kinds of reasons. I mean, first of all, you're kind of like post-COVID, it just reads in a completely different way. And you were just starting to, we, we did a writing retreat like July 2020 together, right? In the heart of COVID when you were starting. I think to... I, I, read, I wrote the first draft in like April of the COVID spring, yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, long, exactly. the longest month, the, so... the March that lasted four months. The work from home thing looks different from our perspective, right? Um, but also there's this really fascinating gender thing that you kind of touched on earlier, but kind of, a, so tell us about this earlier work from home movement and what it was, where it came from, what, what the whole idea was. Yeah, so look, I made a historical argument about situating a phenomenon in, in time that in many ways seems timeless. Mm -hmm. um, and the argument is that during the 1980s and 90s, uh, a, a movement emerged encouraging people to find ways to work from home, either for their traditional employer or increasingly for themselves as the owner of a home-based business. Um, so part of the story is technological. Um, you know, I, I never thought I would actually write something that I thought was interesting about the history of telecommuting, uh -huh. but I did. Um, and then I trimmed it down to like three paragraphs because I don't think the reader can really deal with much more <laughs> of the history of telecommuting. Yeah. Um, but, but what was telecommuting? Well, it comes out of the 70s, right? So uh -huh. the, the idea of, of what they called telework and other countries still call telework was a, f a product of the energy crisis. Uh -huh. And so there was, there's a big group uh, study in, in Los Angeles, which is sort of, you know, known for horrible traffic and sprawl and, you know, it takes forever to get places being like, all right, well, what are we going to do? You know, gas prices are high and we all know the environment is a problem and pollution. Um, we have all of these people coming from various places to all these downtown offices mm -hmm. and there's traffic and gridlock and it's just nasty. And so the original idea is you create like outposts um, where instead of having a large employer in one spot, you split it up into a number of different nodes and then you kind of coordinate who goes where. That's the original version of telework, which is not your house because you don't have the technological infrastructure to do anything at your house. Right. Um, you know, right. still paying for local phone calls, right? Let alone um, sending faxes and, and uh, you know, things like that. In the 80s, fax machine actually matters quite a bit. Um, it's a great uh, book on the history of the fax machine by our business history colleague, Jonathan Coopersmith, um, who, you know, takes that story all the way back to the 1840s when the thing is invented, which mind, yeah. mind boggling that like the fax follows the photograph and the telegraph. Um, but by the 80s, there's 
changes in in how um, this, the, the the networks are, are configured that allow people to put fax machines in their homes, um, get different kind of telecommunication telecommunication setups, and it becomes more feasible and less expensive to work from home. And there's a there's kind of a community of of professionals of consultants that are starting to like make the case to large corporations to you know, municipal governments or whatever, say, you can save money by having some percentage of your workforce work from home. They don't have to come in. And companies are resistant to this. The same stuff that we're talking about today. Like, well, how do I know they're working? Yeah, you know, yeah. how do I know that, you know, they're, they're going to be as productive? And how do I, and, and like, yeah. well, you know, the argument is they'll be happier. They'll be, yeah. you know, less tired and they won't have sat in traffic for an hour yeah. and whatever. Um, and, you know, so that's good. And they'll, you know, a happy worker is a productive worker. Um, and of course, there's nothing like the surveillance technology that we have today where, you know, there are people working from home and the bosses can literally see like, are there fingers on the yeah, key yeah. keypad, right? Um, but anyway, there's, this is happening. And at the same time, they're making an argument that, you know, w while you've, once you've started to kind of cut the cord, why not just go all in and, um, and, and, and open a home-based business yeah. um, in whatever field you know? And of course, the argument for doing that is the same as, you know, the argument for going into business in any sense. Maybe you have a skill that is transferable and you work in a field where a single person can kind of survive on their own, but maybe there's efficiencies to the corporate structure that you were in that are very hard to replicate by yourself, you know, when you've got to do your own billing and marketing and, oh, yeah. um, and so on and so forth. Um, one of the key parts of this story is the role of, of gender. Uh, and the yeah. way that these ideas about working at home are particularly targeted toward women and particularly women with young children uh -huh. as a way, as I said before, to sort of have it all, yeah. right? And, and, and both provide for your family uh, and the other, you know, achieve the other um, personal satisfactions of, of work life uh, and kind of bring it all together. And so there's, there are books, there are clubs, there are how-to manuals, there are government reports, there are conferences, all of which are saying, you know, working from home and, you know, this is the, the, the thing. And it, it's the wave of the future. Yeah. And I, I tell the story of a book um, by the, um, the writer uh, Alvin Toffler. Okay. Right, oh, who is our who, favorite guy? He describes himself as a futurist, and he's famous for you know creating the idea of information overload and all this stuff. But he writes a book in 1980 um, that basically prophesizes that working from home is like the wave of the future. That yeah, we're gonna yeah. we're gonna leave all these office buildings in the downtown areas to just crumble, and we're gonna achieve this you know wonderful reunion of family and economic role. Um, yeah. seemingly kind of oblivious to the actual history of like working yeah, from home. Yeah, he knows nothing about history, yeah, or production. And there are historians, I write about this as well, yeah. um, Eileen Boris. So you bring it, this is, it's a wonderful moment with this uh, famous historian of gender and labor, Eileen Boris, becomes a historical actor yeah, and comes into the Yeah, because she shows up in the archive. And I'm like, hey, look at that, it's <laughs> Professor Boris. Um, because she's out there saying, as as a as a scholar of labor and and yeah. women's history in particular, being like, no, like this is a recipe for exploitation, right. and we know that because that's what it used to look like, you know, in in a sort of pre uh, earlier period uh, when women were doing piecework, yeah, put it the right, what put it the putting out system, the putting out system, right, the, and this was something that like the labor movement fought against. Yeah. Um, you know, working by the piece and get or yeah, getting yeah, paid yeah, by yeah. the piece, um, you know, being kind of at the at the whim of uh, a supplier to bring you something to do. Yeah. Uh, the, the the lack of oversight, the lack of a you know, how do you enforce laws against you know doing all the horrible things that we associate with you know the late nineteenth early twentieth centuries and triangle shirtwaist company. I mean, all yeah, all of that yeah, kind yeah. of the the horrible aspects of early industrial employment. Um, and you know. The futurists are like, oh, man, I forget about yeah, all that. Yeah. And Boris is like, are you guys out of your minds? Like, yeah. so it's, it's a fascinating debate. You also have some beautiful vision, like numbers of delusion in that, in that chapter of like projections by Toffler and, and some organizations right. about how fast working from home was going to grow and then what it was actually, I mean, it was growing, but it went up from like 1% to 2% or something well, like yeah, that. Well, it grew yeah. and then it stopped growing. Right. And, you know, again, pre-COVID, look, I, we still don't know how it's all shaking out yeah. in the aftermath of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a revived debate. But pre-COVID, the, the trends were absolutely in the other direction. So the, the, the examples I use by the, you know, 
20, by 21st century, um, you know, just think about, you know, companies like Facebook and Google that put all of this energy into creating campuses yeah. that people want to come to that, you know, and their idea is you're going to get the most out of your workforce if they've got a foosball uh, table in the break room and like free lemonade and, and you know, maybe a yeah. child care center, but you sure as hell don't want them sitting in their house. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You want them to come together in a in a workplace, yeah. um, and so the the vibe, even among the kind of most allegedly cut you know cutting edge or, or counterculture, whatever. Yeah, exactly. It was it was very much you know, work is a thing that you do in a place that yeah. is not your home. Yep, we'll give you games to play. Yeah, and uh, free food. Sure. Yeah, and you can you can have take a nap and um, you know, yeah. kombucha on tap, yoga classes. But, but, but then, but then, but then, get your ass back to your desk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, I think part of your argument is one of the things you're saying is by the '90s, okay, this ideology is kind of everywhere. It's bipartisan in a hardcore way. Like the Clinton, Clinton Gore, there is into it. Is Reich is into it? All these characters are into it. Um, and you can say anything about that that you. Want, but I also wanted to ask you. You have chapters on like fran uh, franchises and then kind of gig work, the rise of the gig economy, right? And I was wondering, like, there's been a lot written about each the history of franchises and the history of gig economy, or like history in quote. You know, I mean, there's been a lot written about the gig economy. Okay, there's Lou's book. Yes, yeah, because Hyman has entered the chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, which is you know is my favorite thing on the topic, but. What is so? What I wanted to ask you is like, what not that you have like a critical angle on existing stuff on franchises or gig work necessarily, but what does it look like when we pull those, those into this story? You know what I mean? Right. So, the thing I observed, I, I, so I wanted to do two things I wanted to, to take the reader on uh, a history of both of those things and, and to show yeah. this. And this is, you know, you mentioned my second book uh, at the beginning. I do have this kind of inclination to show people that business history can actually be super informative to things that you care about in, in the present. So, yeah. you know, we talk about franchises, I go, you know, back to the 19th century and we talk yeah. about the earliest companies that figured out how to kind of set these things up. And then you go through McDonald's and, you know, the cosmetics and, and all this sort of stuff. But by the time you get to the, to the 90s and, and 2000s, what you see is that, you know, franchise or franchise companies and specifically like they're kind of, uh, lobbying organizations, their, their representative organizations are very obviously using the exact same language as the entrepreneurship people, as the be your own boss movement, as the work yeah. from home people. They're all using the exact same kind of language of empowerment, language of um, individual yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. power and authority and breaking free from the strictures of the workaday world. Which is also what Uber is saying. Which and that's exactly what the gig economy does yeah, 20 years yeah, later. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so the, the connection between the International Franchise Association saying, you know, be your own boss, you're in business for yourself, but not by yourself, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And Uber saying no shift, no boss, no, no problem yeah. or whatever, whatever, the, right. whatever that slogan was. Um, yeah. It's the same ethos, right? It's yeah. the same argument. Slightly different, you know, technological and economic worlds, and of course, you know, there still are franchises, and yeah. in fact, many of the most most exploitative franchises today, um, you know, the really small, like janitorial services kind of things, where uh -huh. um, they tell you you can be your own boss. Um, what they don't tell you is that being your own boss sometimes means you don't get paid, right? Or you get paid less than the minimum wage, right. or you know, you uh, go into debt, or you lose it all. That's what being your own boss can mean. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It's not, there's nothing secure about it and it can be exploitative. Um, especially, I mean, this and the worst cases of this are when the system is really set up so that it's basically impossible to, um, to succeed. Um, Multi-level marketing, same exact sure, phenomenon, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, is it theoretically possible in some of these companies to do very well? Well, theoretically, yes, and that's why they're not yeah. shut down. Like when it when it's proven that it's theoretically not possible, <laughs> that's when yeah, yeah. the law cracks down on you. Mm -hmm. um, but all, I mean, you know, there's plenty of examples of you know multi level marketing companies where it's pretty well understood that the only way you're going to make any money is by getting in early and yeah. Which again harkens back to that theme I highlighted earlier of a lot of time, well, a lot of reasons people go into this is because they're in a tough spot. It's not. 
And even though we celebrate entrepreneurship as like this, you know, this thing will make you rich and it has to do with, you know, power and all these things. A lot of personal, times it's personal like, virtue. Yeah. yeah, yeah. A lot of times it's because you're you're screwed, actually, is why you turn to this stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, and as I said, you know, at the very beginning, I I, I don't want to judge anyone's individual decisions. Oh, no, no, no. But, but I do want to see a world where we have we have a clearer set of priorities. Well, I, you know, I also wanted to mention we I gotta connect you and my buddy Lana Swartz, who's in UVA's media studies unit, because she's got this project on scams. Oh, cool. Um, and you guys, you guys could talk for hours about this book, about some of the things you're thinking about working on in the future. Yeah, so, um, uh, okay. So, I mean, you know, in STS land, when I ask a so what question, it's like, and it's not a so what question, but it'll be like, policy recommendations that's not where i want to go with you um but it, it has to do with like um well it has to do with like what the kind of upshot is for you right i think one thing clearly and you know this is what you and i both do um in our ways and together is the ending the delusion part like trying to you do a lot of work in the book of making it clear that there is bullshit said about this stuff yeah. and then like but I wanted to ask you, like, is there other stuff? Like, where does bigness fit it, fit for you? Are you, are you like, a, you know, like, are you less a critic of bigness? I, well, less than who? I mean, yeah, yeah. than some, sure. Yeah. There are certainly people who... You're not an anarchist. I, I'm not an anarchist and I'm not a Brandeisian. I mean, if you want to get yeah. super nerdy and historical so about like, it. Tell people what a Brandeisian is. I mean, loosely, this is just the idea that the solution to um, corporate power and size is to break up yeah. large entities into smaller entities. Yeah. And I think there are times where that's appropriate and useful. Yeah. And there are times when, um, you know, a, a, a strong, a better regulatory system and better rules and, and yeah. restrictions could accomplish the same thing. And, and yeah. this, yeah. these are often, being big, right? Yeah. And these are yeah. often kind of juxtaposed as like, you know, it's one or the other. Right. Um, and so the, the, the Brandeisian argument is basically what I just said is super naive because politics is inherently corrupt and the rich are always going to run everything. Yeah. And sure, I mean, that I, I understand that argument. Um, so, th but the regulatory argument is basically like there is space in a political world for, um, you know, for, for people to exercise rules and create the kind of world that they want to live in. And yeah. if that's, if that's hopelessly naive, like, I guess I'll own that. I'm a regulationist in that way too. That's how I refer to myself. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's like sometimes big regulated is better than small, actually. Yeah. I mean, there are advantages that size can convey. Um, and then there are other times when when it's not. Uh, you know, yeah. and, and I think, you know, making it super simple and putting it on a bumper sticker isn't helping anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, like, there's the end of the delusion. In, a, in an ideal world, there's questioning the fetishization of smallness. What else? What, I mean, is there anything else? Like, you know, I think the, the, and this is related to the questioning of the, of the delusion is, is, you know, paying attention to the underlying issues rather than, you know, simply saying, here's the, the shiny new solution that's right. going to fix it. And whether so that- So like if it's poverty. If it's poverty, if it's inequality, if it's stagnant wages, if it's uh, exclusion, sexism, racism, xenophobia, you know, um, that, you know, look at what the, what the problem is. I mean, you know, yeah. the, the example of, you know, women should work at home so that they can take care of their kids, sort of overlooking the fact that, you know, you could have a child care policy that is... Uh, th that accomplishes the same thing and then maybe it gives people the freedom to figure out, do yeah. you want to work at home? Do you want to work someplace else? Do you not want to work? Um, that, you know, a, a collective solution to that that doesn't just say, you go out and be innovative and do your own thing and, and that will solve your problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're turning to that moment where I ask people what's next, right? And so there is a project I want you to talk about the the shovel thing, maybe, sure. if you're up for that. Um, but I also, we're going to do some stuff together that people are going to hear about soon. Yes. Right? That is the plan. And so, I mean, can I say that we're going to have a podcast on 90s history? Is that okay to say? Yeah. No, Lee and I love the po love the 90s. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. Good. And, uh, and, and Lee loves the podcast. No, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I like, I, no, I'm excited for it. Yeah. So, um, so I, I, I've been interested in... Uh, in, in pushing forward the the timing of how we understand history. Um, and, you know, when I was 25 and starting graduate school 20-something years ago, 
that was the 1970s, and that's kind of where my yeah. focus has been. Um, well, time marches on, and, and I'm older and grayer, but yeah. I, I think that... And there's been a lot on the 80s. And the 80s, right. And, you know, the 90s, um, you know, I, there's, 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 there's a new outpouring of work that is not just kind of rehashing the same journalistic garbage right. that we've been living with for 30 years, and is actually trying to do the work that historians know how to do to yeah. you know what you might think of as the cutting edge of yeah. uh, of history and and so in that spirit Lee and I are thinking of uh having this uh this podcast and and um I think it's be fun man and people love the 90s and you know we're going to play with around with SNL and maybe the OJ trial I do think they're going to like the 90s less the way we do it though cuz it's like <laughs> it's a lot less flannel and oh, like shit. No, 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 no. We need flannel and stuff, man. Um, Come on. Well, the flannel's back, man. Yeah, we can. We should take a photo together in flannel as one of our promo images, maybe with gr like unbuttoned. I think we should just find the pictures of us at seventeen. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the, I just want you to briefly, and this is where I need to connect you with Lana again. But like, um, how would you put it? Like, uh, is it get the history of get rich quick schemes? Is that how you like what you've been thinking about? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've been fascinated, and I think this, this. You know, one day I'll work for myself. Gets into the uh, the fascination with people trying to 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 get rich quick. Um, the the observation I have is that you know throughout business history, and not just in the United States, but around the world, there's a phenomenon that people often observe that like the people who are trying to get rich quick often don't. Yeah. But people who are helping, supporting, encouraging. Uh, others to get rich quick might get rich slower, but they tend to do pretty well. And so the, the classic incarnation of this is, you know, the, the expression from, from the gold rush in, you know, California, um, in 1849, right? If you wanted to make money in the gold rush, um, you didn't mine the gold, you sold the shovels. As Leland Stanford did, correct? That's where the money is. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, what I'm interested in doing is taking that observation and looking throughout uh, various parts of business history and saying, look, what, what, um, what can we learn about this? And, and I think in the modern, in the recent period, in the recent past, um, it's all over the place. Um, it's in this book, you know, um, the, 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 the franchise, uh, franchise company that's telling the, the franchisee or the, the multi-level marketing person or the, um, or the person telling the entrepreneur, you know, the, the business school professor telling the, uh, the entrepreneur student how to get rich quick is uh, doing just fine. I predict that business associations will come into the story at some point. Man, I really do think I've, I've, I've exercised <laughs> that demon. I think I've just- I'm putting you on the hook for I've, this. I've gotten it out I'm, of my yeah, system after 20 years. I'm glad you worked years. with that therapist for so long. And uh, yeah. Ben, my so friend- So Business Roundtable, give me a call. <laughs> I'm, I'm back on board. <laughs> ben, my friend, thank you so much for coming on and taking the time to talk to me today. That was great. Super happy to be here. Let's do it again. I hope you enjoyed this episode of our podcast. You can reach us with questions, comments, and suggestions at leevinsel at gmail.com or by following me on Twitter at STS underscore news or on YouTube at People's Things. Our podcast is distributed by the New Books Network, the leading platform for academic podcasts so that you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Peoples and Things, like most things in this world, depends on the work of many people. I want to thank my brother Jake Vinsel for writing the music for the show. I want to thank my buddy Juliana Castro for designing the logos for the podcast. You can check out her work at julianacastro.co. Joe Fort is the producer for the podcast, and Mandy Lamb is the production assistant. This podcast and other Peoples and Things programming are produced in affiliation with Virginia Tech Publishing and supported by the Center for Humanities and the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. For information about other podcasts from Virginia Tech Publishing, visit publishing.vt.edu. For the entire Peoples and Things team, I am Lee Vinsel. And most importantly, I want to thank you for listening. Thanks.